Hello, this is a new interview with the ex-commander of U.S. Army in Europe, General Ben Hodges. Hi, General. Good morning. How are you, Tetya? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, so today your position is? I am today the senior advisor for Human Rights First. Okay. So we will uh, ask you about a lot of questions, including question of Ukrainian army and uh, human rights too. Uh, so the first question is why for Ukraine it takes so long, almost a year, um, to receive tanks, to start to receiving tanks. And we have not yet even seen them in Ukraine. Still Ukrainian soldiers are in training. And how can actually several hundreds of tanks change the situation in the front line? Well, I think um, the, the process for delivering things has been uh, incremental. Um, and for, for different reasons, I, I wish it had been quicker, that decisions would be made sooner. Um, I, I do believe that um, uh, good people are uh, overly concerned about the possibility of a nuclear escalation, so they're being very cautious in what they provide. Um, I think that um, also, I mean, there are various legal reasons, and so keeping the alliance together um, it has also been an important part of this, getting all the NATO countries plus the other um, countries, more than 50 nations together, who are still providing capability. Not as fast as needed, but it's it's coming. Um, I think uh, tanks it will be a, an important contribution to Ukraine's ability to penetrate Russian defenses uh, later this year when the general staff determines that the time is right. So um, whether they're there now or if they're there, if they're ready to be used in two months or whatever, I think the general staff will make the best decision on how to incorporate, to integrate um, these uh, new tanks, mostly Leopards, um, that will be very good and welcome additions to Ukrainian armed armored force. Airplanes. Will it be F-16, A-10, or some European one? Uh, how much will Western uh, uh, airplanes change the situation in the front line? Except, of course, improving the functioning of our air defense system. Fighters will be able to shoot down Russian missile, missiles and drones. Well, look, um, Ukraine's air force has been incredible. What they have done throughout the war, even though they have been outnumbered, they have surprised the world with how well they have been able to resist uh, Russian Air Force attempts um, and the failure of Russia to achieve air superiority in the early days was uh, also quite a surprise to Air Force professionals. I think this is due in part to Ukraine's Air Force and Ukraine's air defense, as well as poor uh, management and, and lack of training by Russian Air Force. Uh, there's no doubt that a Ukrainian pilot could learn to operate an F-16 or other Western aircraft very, very quickly, much quicker than it would take a normal pilot starting, especially if you had a Ukrainian pilot that was already experienced. Um, but I think that uh, what's, what's key is that the uh, West helps Ukraine with long-range precision weapons, whether that's an F-16 or a Tecums or drones or uh, small diameter bombs, things that have longer range that are needed to isolate Crimea and to make Crimea untenable for Russian forces. Crimea is the decisive part of this war. That's what Ukraine has to liberate this year. And so all of these systems, including F-16s or A-10s, would help in doing that, as well as, of course, providing ground support to Ukrainian armored force that would be used to penetrate uh, Russian defenses. There is no one system that changes everything. So um, I, tr I try to stay away from too much conversation about a specific platform, a specific weapon, and instead talk about Capability. That's why I emphasize the importance of long-range precision and a strong armored force 
whatever the systems are. Um, the F-16 clearly is the right platform that's needed um, for a variety of reasons, but I, I can't explain why the administration is still reluctant to do this. They, they, pro they probably will eventually do it. I mean, that's the way this has been going all year. Um, I, th I, I think we are overly cautious about Russia escalation to a nuclear conflict, which I just absolutely do not believe that they will do. Okay, so uh, you will not answer when Ukraine can receive uh, Atacams or any other type of long-range uh, uh, missiles. Uh, I wish I wish they already had it. I mean, I have yeah. you know that I have been advocating for this for months. So um, I, I, all I can continue to do is emphasize why Ukraine needs long-range precision capability, whatever the type it is. How can Russia respond to all these uh, deliveries from your point of view? Well, uh, there's nothing they can do. Um, I mean, they can't stop it. Otherwise, I mean, they for a year now, they have not been able to, to interdict the delivery of equipment coming from Poland. They have not been able to do that at all. They don't have the ability to. Um, I think uh, their Air Force is incapable of doing what we call dynamic targeting where they can detect a train that's coming and then they can go find it and hit it or a convoy. Um, Russia is wasting all of its multi-million dollar precision weapons against apartment buildings and uh, power uh, generators. Um, so, I mean, there's just, there's nothing else they, they can do. Um, they, they, their so-called mobilization appears to me to uh, uh, once again uh, be uh, unsuccessful, or they delayed it, or whatever. I mean, they it was such a disaster back in September when they did a partial mobilization, and half a million Russian military-aged males left the country to avoid being mobilized. And we saw that the Russian Ministry of Defense was not prepared with accommodation, equipment, training, uniforms, basic things. And so I don't think they have fixed all those problems. Um, and so what they do, they, you know, they bring in bodies from um, all over the Russian Federation and with a uh, minimum amount of training, push them into the meat grinder uh, without concern about how many thousands of uh, these uh, unfortunate Russian soldiers are killed in the process. So I, I just, I'm not seeing evidence yet of any special new thing that they could do. Uh, Moscow has already launched a new offensive campaign along the entire front line in the East, from Ugledar to Svatova. In certain areas, they have both a numerical and artillery advantage. I was in Bakhmut in the first half of January. It was just the constant arrivals of artillery in a large city of 80,000 people, where about 10,000 people still remain. The situation the same is similar in Nugledar. One Ukrainian soldier fighting in Bakhmut describes the battle in neighborhood like a scene of out of zombie movies. Uh, we were fighting for about 10 hours in a row, and it wasn't like just waves, it was just uninterrupted. So it was just like they didn't stop coming and coming. Uh, what should Ukrainian army do in this situation? Well, I, let me turn that around. Think about how impressive um, is the performance of Ukrainian defenders. I mean, this war started almost nine years ago in 2014 with Russia having all the advantages. Uh, and then the special military operations started a year ago with Russia having all the advantages, except that Ukraine was defending their home. Um, and still, after all of this, Russia is still trying to capture Bakhmut. I mean, that's, that, that tells you something about the quality of Ukraine's defense with what they have, uh, the, the quality of Ukrainian people compared to Russian capability. And, um, you know, and of course, you know, and your, your listeners know, Bakhmut is, um, is so far in the eastern part of of uh, Ukraine. I, I keep my map of Ukraine with me all the time. And so when I look, you know, Bakhmut is 
here, all, all in the far eastern part of Ukraine, it's, it's useful to keep in mind this terrible fighting. And of course, Ukraine is suffering casualties. It is so, so far to the east. And that's the best the Russians can do. Um, I think that uh, what General Cavoli, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, said is true. That precision can defeat mass. That um, Russian mass infantry requires Russian mass artillery support. How do you defeat mass artillery? You destroy headquarters. You destroy ammunition storage sites. And you destroy transportation network required to move artillery ammunition. If you destroy those three things, it doesn't matter how many artillery tubes, Russian artillery, there is. And then the Russian mass infantry does not get the support it needs to have any chance of advancing against Ukrainian defenders. So the sooner that we can get um, uh, the long range, longer range precision weapons, the longer range than what is already available for HIMARS, uh, then you can destroy Russian headquarters, Russian ammunition storage, Russian transportation. That's how we do this. At the same time, New York Times article suggests that Russia has now 350,000 troops in Ukraine and 150,000 troops in reserve. That is close to double what they have had in the initial invasion, big invasion, I mean, 2022. In some areas, Ukrainian military talk about advantage of Russians 17 to 1. Uh, what can be how we can counter this increased in number of uh, Russian troops. I know they are not now any more contract army only. It's more about mobilized or even this uh, farmer prisoners from Russian prisons, but still there is they are outnumbered. Okay. Um, history is full of examples of uh, armies that were outnumbered being successful, of defenders, especially defending their country, being successful. Um, I am very skeptical of those numbers of the uh, the report of, you know, basically 500,000 Russian troops. Um, that's, that's not necessarily 500,000 fighters. And, and so, you know, Ukraine has that many troops. I, I think, of course, Russia has bigger numbers in certain places like around Bakhmut. But the... Uh, we know from history that the defender or the uh, attacker usually requires at least a three to one advantage overall. And while Russia may have that in certain places, they still have not been able to do more than the occasional village. So uh, I think people are, are focusing too much on these big numbers because they sound so terrifying. But 300,000 Russians does not equal uh, not even 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers in terms of quality. And, um, you know, the logistic system necessary to keep these Russian soldiers in the fight is very weak. And I think that the, uh, the, the more that we help Ukraine attack that logistics, attack transportation, attack headquarters, attack ammunition, uh, the more effective that they can be. But they need longer range precision capabilities. About long range. Will the U.S. government finally give permission uh, for Ukraine to use HIMARS strikes on the territory of Russian Federation or Belarus, for example, uh, to kill S-300, which are constantly shelling Kharkiv city? Um, probably not. Um, I, don't, I don't know that. Um, I think the U.S. Is, or the administration has been concerned about anything that would escalate. Of course, I believe that it is the right, what well, it's it's international law, that it's the right of any country to defend itself. Um, it's impressive to me that Ukraine has resist, has thus far resisted uh, launching HIMAR strikes uh, against um, Russian systems inside Russia. Um, this is a uh, this is a difficult uh, political question because keeping all the nations on the side is also important and it, if and even though it would be um, 
I would like to see Ukraine be able to strike Russian uh, targets inside Russia um, if it meant that the support group, the Ramstein contact group, if countries began to fall away at this point, I think that would be unfortunate. Um, it's all, but you know, Ukraine does have some of its own capabilities. It has used some drones to, to go after airfields inside Russia, for example. And it's also interesting that Ukraine has not done anything against targets of Belarus. Why is that? I think this is also Ukraine recognizing to show restraint so that to, to not give Belarus a reason or provocation to come into the fight in a more So uh, all of us have to make these calculations. Uh, if Russia will launch a massive mass missile strike on the, on the first anniversary of Russia, a uh, full-scale war against Ukraine, what should be an adequate response from Ukraine's side, from your point of view? I think, uh, I think uh, Ukraine will um, continue to do what it's been doing, which I think is to be very disciplined, very intelligent, uh, very creative, and in, in when and where it strikes Russia. So uh, it's, it's, I don't have a special advice for how the general staff should, uh, should do something, you know, on the 24th of February or whatever. I think they will, what they do will be better than anything that I would have come up with, but they, they're not going to waste critical munitions just for a symbolism. You mentioned Lukashenko, so I want to ask, uh, how would you advise Ukrainian uh, leadership to deal with Lukashenko and Belarus? They were already uh, used as a springboard for attack Ukraine a year ago, and now they are used as a training field for the Russian military. What we should do about it? Uh, I would say if that's all that Russia is able to do in Belarus, that's a good thing. I think Lukashenko really does not want to involve his soldiers in this conflict. Um, he only has, I think, maybe 10 battalions, battalion tactical groups. I think he knows that they would be uh, destroyed in days if they entered the fight because they are even less quality than the Russian uh, formations are. Uh, they're, they're, they don't. I don't think soldiers of Belarus really want to fight against Ukraine and vice versa. I don't think people of Belarus really are interested in a conflict with people of Ukraine. So... If uh, if Russia trains there in Belarus and that's it, and maybe gets some ammunition from Belarus, then I think uh, um, that's that's not such a terrible thing. If if Belarus is not um, being more active in supporting uh, supporting Russia, uh, why, in your opinion, the Russian army has focused on massive strikes over the past months on civilian infrastructure? and not on military targets, which in fact is terrorist activity. Yeah, it is terrorist activity. Uh, and they're all war crimes. And, and, the, and the list of war crimes is being recorded and uh, monitored by the ICC, the International Criminal Court. And um, there will be accountability for this one day. Um, in the meanwhile, they're wasting thousands of expensive missiles and drones and, and rockets against uh, targets that do not give them any strategic advantage. This, this is a strategic bombing campaign that has not damaged or reduced the will of Ukrainian people. In fact, I think if anything, it's, it's made it stronger. Uh, and at some point, the general staff has got to be thinking, why are we launching multi-million dollar missiles against a power station that will be rebuilt uh, in just a few days or against a civilian target. Um, so their, their, their uh, objectives, they're failing on every aspect of this uh, strategic bombing campaign. Um, and, and I think uh, the more they do this, the, uh, the more it causes the West to also want to defeat them. It, it doesn't do anything to help Russia's cause, is what I'm saying. What do you think? Can the U.S. and EU really prevent the use of weapon of mass destruction uh, if Putin will use it in Ukraine? And what should be the reaction on West in case they 
use it. Can we expect some kind of protection like nuclear umbrella or some kind of this? Well, I think my president has already warned Russia that there would be catastrophic consequences if Russia were to use a nuclear weapon. I think he's made that very clear, uh, both in a formal public way and also in in uh, uh, different channels. This has been communicated to the Kremlin. Do not do this. Uh, and I think the Kremlin believes that. Uh, I also don't believe that the, that the general staff um, wants to use a nuclear weapon because they, they know there's no advantage. It, w it would not change anything on the ground. It would not give them any advantage over Ukraine. They might kill more innocent people. They might destroy more towns. But it would not change the battlefield to their advantage. So why would they do something that gives them no advantage and for which they will suffer catastrophic consequences? Uh, in the Cold War, the Soviet Union uh, had tactical nuclear weapons. So a tactical nuclear weapon is something that is much smaller than what was used against uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, but it, was, it would have been used to create a gap in NATO defenses. And then you would have a, a uh, mobile force that was properly trained and equipped to operate in a contaminated environment, either for chemical weapons or nuclear weapons. That doesn't exist anymore. There is no big mobile formation that's trained and equipped to be able to exploit that kind of a gap. And I don't think there's a place where Russia could use a nuclear weapon that would change that situation. So it's not practical. And of course, they're not going to use a strategic nuclear weapon, which are primarily aimed against the United States because of what that would entail for Russia. And also, I think President Xi has uh, communicated to the Kremlin do not do this. Nobody in the world, even even nations that are not sympathetic to Ukraine, except maybe Iran, nobody wants Russia to use a nuclear weapon. Um, and I don't think that Putin is suicidal. He's cruel. Uh, he doesn't care about human life, except his own. And so I don't think he is suicidal. Uh, and I think the people around him also are thinking about life after him. And then if they want to get back to anything that looks like normal, you know, they will stop him from doing this. So this is why I'm very, very doubtful. Uh, I take it seriously, the threat, but I think it's extremely unlikely that they would actually do it. Uh, you several times mentioned that uh, the war will end in 2023. Uh, how you think it will be finished? Okay, so... I, when I say that, I always say if, if the West does everything that we said we would do, and if we deliver these long-range precision weapons, then I think Crimea could be liberated by the end of the summer, and then everything else would follow after that. Crimea is the decisive terrain. Um, you make Crimea, you liberate Crimea uh, first by isolating it, by, by severing those two roads that connect it to Russia. One is over the Kerch Bridge. The other one is the so-called land bridge that runs from Rostov through Mariupol, Melitopol, into Crimea. You you cut all the bridges. You, you make it impossible for Russia to move anything in, in and out of Crimea. And then with long-range weapons, you make sure that they can never use Sevastopol. Uh, Saki, Zhankoi, other places where there are Russian facilities on Crimea. I mean, it's very vulnerable, actually, if you use long-range weapons. And I think by making it untenable, that's how you begin the liberation. Eventually, Ukrainian ground forces, of course, would have to um, enter the enter the peninsula, uh, but, but not until after uh, long-range weapons have made it untenable for Russian forces. What do you think, what will happen in Russia after uh, liberation of Crimea? I, I think we will see big changes. I think, um, uh, I, of course, I, I, I can't predict how or what happens to Putin or his regime. Uh, but if Crimea is liberated, then I doubt he will be in power um, by the end of this year. Um, I think the Chechens, Kadyrov, 
I think he is waiting and watching. He talks a lot, but you don't you don't hear much about Chechen soldiers getting butchered in a meat grinder. Um, I think he is protecting them uh, either to be the savior or the successor or to break away. I think uh, Prigozhin, um, th there is certainly a lot of friction between Prigozhin and uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov. Um, I, I read yesterday, it may, maybe it's true or not, but that uh, uh, the Kremlin said that uh, Prigozhin's name should not be used in any official Russian media. So this, this, I think this is the beginning of isolating Prigozhin. I mean, if Putin had to pick between Shoigu and Prigozhin, I think he would see that Prigozhin is more dangerous to him. And so uh, I, I think there's a lot of different forces that would be uh, in conflict inside Russia. Uh, and to, I'm not an expert on the Kremlin, so I could not possibly name all the different characters that are there. Um, so I, I'm not going to predict what will happen, but I think there would be significant changes happening inside Russia once Crimea is liberated. What do you think? What is more safe for Ukraine? One big Russia, even with change the government after Putin, just an example, but we do not know for who, but anyway, or uh, if it will be fragmented and uh, separated by local view, like Chechnya separated, like, uh, I don't know, some uh, uh, Tatarstan, Bashkartostan separated. What do you think is more safe for Ukraine? One big Russia or several different countries? Well, the safest thing for Ukraine is for Ukraine to have all of its territory back, including Crimea, and, and to have a good uh, security agreement first with the U.S. and, and with uh, and with its other neighbors like Poland, for example, Romania. Um, that's the first thing, and for Ukraine to continue to modernize and build up its uh, uh, its forces. And also for Ukraine to uh, uh, get rid of corruption, because when you have corruption inside Ukraine, that makes it that makes it vulnerable to Russian interference, and it gives other countries an excuse not to support Ukraine. So that's you know uh, Ukraine safety and security is first is that, but certainly all of us have to be thinking about the possibility of a breakup of the Russian Federation. I think this is a very real possibility, and we should anticipate, you know, what happens to nuclear weapons, what happens to control of the energy infrastructure. The Chinese obviously will be very interested in that, as well India uh, and Iran. Uh, what happens to all the, the money? I mean, there's a lot of money there that should be in the hands of a government to take care of their own people, not in the hands of a few oligarchs that have managed to hide it in places. So uh, I think all of us need to be thinking about those implications. It, there will be huge numbers of refugees. There will be violence, uh, payback, potential breakaway. Um, but I, I can't predict what exactly it'll look like. General, maybe there is something I didn't ask you about and which is important to say. Well, you know, I uh, I retired from the U.S. Army five years ago, and then I worked uh, for the Center for European Policy Analysis, a think tank that always focused on the Black Sea region and the Baltic region and Central Eastern Europe, and I, I really enjoyed working with SEPA. But it was time to move on after almost five years, and so I had joined Human Rights First this past summer, and I like Human Rights First because uh, they have programs about accountability, holding people, holding autocrats accountable for their crimes. So what Russia is doing against Ukraine, this is a war of aggression, which is a crime, but also the individual crimes of deportation, genocide, uh, destruction of uh, or, or targeting civilians. Uh, these are things that Human Rights First cares about. So I like to be a part of that. And also uh, countering extremism in Europe and in the United States because that makes us, when we are vulnerable to extremists, 
you know, of course, Russia will uh, exploit that. So I like being a part of uh, of human rights first because, I mean, as a soldier, I spent 40 years defending human rights, and now I have a chance as a retired soldier to continue doing that. Thank you, General. It was like always a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, I hope to do it again in the future. Thank you very much, and good luck to you and all the other Ukrainian families that are trying to educate their children and protect their families uh, even while under attack. This this is going to be uh, something uh, It's a part of Ukraine's history that uh, nobody will forget. Yes, that's true.